So the way this tends to be tested is they say, show all possible products. And they're testing whether people can think about both the different stereo isomers and maybe more important, the different resonance structures that give us different constitutional isomers. Because it's resonance stabilized, it will do the primary radical? Right. Oh, okay. That's right. That's an important point. Um, that's something that's discussed in that other chapter 14 series video that maybe you haven't read yet. So in there I discussed, <clears throat> remember that in the first semester we learned never make a primary carbocation. Mm -hmm. But now we have to unlearn that. It's okay to make a primary carbocation if it's stabilized by resonance. Well, similarly, we usually try to avoid making primary radicals. Although actually I think it's, you can still, I still think maybe we sometimes did make primary radicals. I don't know if that's quite as bad as a primary carbocation. But anyway, this is really fairly stable because of the resonance. Something, if something is primary but resonance stabilized, it's actually quite stable. Remember that resonance is a very powerful stabilizing force. So we should not think of this as an unhappy electron over here. This is pretty happy because it's really spread out between these two positions. The unhappiness is spread out between the two positions. So it's okay to have uh, primary radicals and carbocations if they're resonance stabilized. So notice here that we actually had two different versions of propagation step two. There's two different versions of propagation step two because there's two different resonance structures that we can start with here. So the important thing here is, um, you, you might not feel like going through this whole mechanism for every problem, but what you should do is draw the radical intermediate. Draw the radical intermediate and all of its resonance structures because that's what tells you where the halogen can attach. If you draw the radical intermediate and all of its resonance structures, that will tell you all the different places that the halogen can attach. Now, this is what is called radical allylic halogenation. This mechanism is radical allylic halogenation. Last term, we just learned about re regular radical halogenation, but now we're learning about radical allylic halogenation. So there was two things we learned here. One thing we learned was that the bromine prefers to attack the allylic carbon because of resonance, and we learned there can be multiple products because of resonance as well. So as, as we've been saying multiple times, the theme for this whole term is resonance. I'm looking for different resonance structures. Now there's another issue here. There's another issue because last term we learned something else that halogens do to alkenes. Do you remember how last term we learned about um, how halogens attack in an anti-dihalogenation on alkenes, where um, where we get this bromonium ion to start with, and then we have an anti-attack like this. And then you would end up with the bromine on both sides, like this, kind of. OK, well, then we have a problem. How do we know that this bromine isn't just going to do that normal um, halogenation reaction? Well, the key is the way to get the allylic reaction is to deliver only small amounts of Br2 at a time. We need some way that's going to deliver only a small amount of Br2 at a time. We want the Br2 to always stay in low concentration. We want the Br2 to stay in low concentration. And there's a trick for that. The trick is to use a Br2 delivery vehicle that will deliver only a small amount of Br2 at a time. And the name of that Br2 delivery vehicle is NVS. So actually, the way I've written this is not the way you would see it. You would, um, so this very important point in your notes that I've been simplifying, this is not the way to write the starting materials. The starting materials won't be written like this. They'll be written like this that will be written like NBS. The B here stands for bromo. That's the key letter here. And basically, all you can think of this as is you think of this as something that delivers, that maintains a constant small concentration of Br2. You should think of this as a Br2. So the mechanism is still the same. I'm still going to start with Br2. I'm still going to start with Br2. We're not going to go through the mechanism by which this provides the Br2. We're just going to say somehow this provides Br2, and then the mechanism is the same as before. So if you see NBS, you know it's going to be an allylic halogenation. But if you just see if you just see like this, if you just see Br2 used by itself, 
then it's just going to be a um, dihalogenation and electrophilic addition, like you saw last term, where a bromine is going to end up on both carbons. So again, the way I was writing it before wasn't really correct. Um, because if you just put Br2 without the NBS, you can just get this product. This is what we learned last term. This is an electrophilic dihalogenation on an alkene. Notice in this case, we're not really attacking the alkene. We're attacking the allylic carbon. So I find it's easy for people to get these confused with each other. So we need to uh, watch out for that. So we don't want to confuse this case and the NBS case. probably are expected to know that this is what NBS looks like. You should be able to recognize it if you see it. By the way, we've already learned what this functional group is. What do we call a carbonyl connected to a nitrogen connected to a carbonyl? We haven't talked about this much, but... It's like anhydride, but it's the name. In Not an amide, but that's something that we're well familiar with. This is something, this is the one we've talked about the least, but this is an imide. This is n bromo succinamide. Well, the imide comes because it's an inamide. By the way, did you guys ever get a chance to learn the names for um, the dicarboxylic acids? We said that you needed to. Well, do you remember what you call a dicarboxylic acid with four carbons? A dicarboxylic acid with four carbons. Might not remember that anymore. Ox. No, that's good. That's the acid. That's the IUPAC name, but remember there's a bunch of common names. Oh, um, ooh. Maybe you didn't get a chance to, no, to memorize those. Yeah, it was the last term. Melonic was three. Right. Ox, whatever, was two. two. And this one is a succinic Oh, yeah. Yeah, succinic acid. Okay, very good. So the carboxyl again, so. So this is formed from the succinic acid. This is a derivative of succinic acid. Succinic acid is the common name for butane dioic acid. So you can see where this name came from. It's not called succinic acid anymore. It's called succinamide, because we've turned the acid into an imide. And you can even see where the n-bromo is coming from, because I think we've learned about this nomenclature too. We're naming the bromine as a substituent on the n. So we're using the N as a locator. So this name, actually, we can understand all the parts of it, N bromo Um Remember that we used an imide in the amine chapter. We used an imide as a nitrogen deliverer, right, um, to avoid overalkylation for amines. Well, we're doing something a little bit similar here, except now we're using this as a bromine deliverer. We're using this imide to deliver the bromine. Again, I don't think we'll go through the whole mechanism, but we know that this is basically going to give us a source of Br2. We won't go through the mechanism, but this is going to give us a source of Br2. and bromosuccinamide. Or NBS. <laughs> 